Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Mentoring Hour today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I just request somebody to uh, please pray. Before we get started, any one of the students who joined us could uh, pray and then we can get started. Some other students go and get the mics and try. Heavenly Father, we just wish to thank you for this uh, hour of uh, mentoring, Father. Father, we just pray that uh, you will uh, minister to us, Father, in this hour. Um, speak to us, Father, and help us, Lord. Uh, in the areas of our lives where we may be struggling or where we need to submit or surrender to you, Father. Um, let thy word minister to us, Father, and bless us this morning, Father. I pray for a blessing upon every member of the faculty and for every single student of the Bible College too, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, um, Sanjay. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this mentoring hour. So essentially, in the mentoring hour, we just like to keep it as a time where you know we can uh, share on different topics and themes. So we kind of have a focus to uh, for that mentoring hour. Uh, but then uh, we keep it open for anything. You can ask any kind of question on life, Christian life, Christian ministry, uh, growing in faith, uh, how do you do ministry practically, so on and so forth. So although we uh, have a focus area um, each Thursday, uh, the, the intent is for us to be available to uh, share on any area uh, that, that, we, uh, that we want to ask about or discuss about. Uh, I'm just going to begin there. So today uh, we're talking a little bit on uh, church and technology. That's the um, theme or focus area for today. Uh, I'll just start with one verse of scripture and then share some things and you know uh, for the, for about ten minutes, and then leave it open for any questions. Questions can be on this particular topic, which is uh, church and technology, or of course you know we could uh, uh, talk any, about anything else that that's uh, that you want to discuss. So um, I just want to read from 1 Corinthians um, chapter 9 and uh, uh, verses, uh, let me just read, verse 19 to 22, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22. I'm just going to quickly read this passage. Um, Paul is really talking about the preaching of the gospel and he shares his motivation here. He says, for though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law to, toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Uh, you see the motivation of the Apostle Paul, that he's, he's, he's talking about various kinds of people that, that he's reaching out to, to the Jews, to the Greeks, to those who are walking under the law, those, those who are you know, outside of the realm of the law. Uh, and, and, and he's saying, look, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into their world. I've become like them. I step into their world in order to reach them. So essentially, in the end of verse 22, he says, I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I just want to paraphrase it, he's saying, look, I'm, I'm getting into people's worlds, I'm getting into you know, their culture, their worldview, their, the way they live life, I'm getting in there uh, in order the goal is, and I want to reach them with the gospel. Um, so today, you know, in, in a world of technology, uh, where so, so many people are connected to technology, using technology. You know, uh, perhaps Paul would have included that. You know, he said, "Look, I'm going into that space. I'm reaching people there." 
uh, because I want to you know share Jesus with them. So um, you know, I'm just going to share a, a little bit uh, on uh, church and technology, and then we can take questions on this theme or uh, or anything else that you feel you want to talk about today. Um, let me just start this over here. All right. So. Uh, so when we talk about technology, we you know many times we think about computers, uh, phones, the internet. Of course, that's a very big part of what we're talking about, uh, and that's a big part where everybody is engaged in. But in technology, we also need to keep in mind that the technology space includes everything, like uh, what we use in church and ministry, which would include you know the audio equipment that we use in church. It would include the media equipment, uh, the you know all the um, uh, equipment that we use for video productions or presentations inside the service, church services, meetings, et cetera, and everything else. So technology, um, the use of technology is widespread uh, and affects many different areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll just touch on a few things. So I just want to run through some, you know, uh, facts, and, and all of this is taken from the online source. So. Uh, you can go and 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 this report uh, as of July 2023 has lots of information and it's it's really good and more than I think 100 slides are there uh, with information on it. I'm just sharing a few slides. So if you look at this data here, you know in in, in our world about about eight little over eight billion people, 57% uh, of them live in cities, out of which about 5.56 billion people, about almost 70% are using are mobile phone users, right? About 70% of the world's population are using mobile phones. So it's like, hey, if you want to reach, seven, you know, we have immediate access if you're using mobile phones. Um, close to 65%, and that may rise, you know, it may just go up even further. It's continued to go further. Uh, close to 65% are connected to the internet. And, uh, sixty percent are using some form of social media. So, uh, mobile phones, internet, social media. These are three big spaces or opportunities for us, where we are, we can reach a huge part of the population. Of course, um, there are people who are not connected. Uh, so that same data is here in, in uh, you know in, in statement form. So there are still about. 2.8 billion, billion people are unconnected, mainly in these regions of the world, southern, south, and uh, East Asia, and some parts of Africa. So yeah, there are people who are uh, not yet connected, but a huge number of people, close to 70%, 60 plus percent of the people are already connected. And uh, they use some form, uh, the internet, mobile phone, or social media. So it's a big opportunity for us. Uh, if you look at how much time people spend, uh, you know, on the internet, on on, on an average daily average, um, so on, on different kinds of uh, media, you know, this is a huge number about six hours, almost seven hours uh, spent on the internet, uh, watching broadcast streaming about three hours per day, uh, social media about two and a half hours per day almost two hours reading online content, um, uh, music almost one and a half hours every day, listening to streaming music or almost an hour, listening to broadcast radio, podcast almost an hour, and again, almost an hour uh, a day spent playing games. So you can see, you know, uh, this is the kind of time people are engaging, but this is where they are spending so much of their time online. Um, if you look at the kind of uh, video content that people are consuming, uh, and uh, this is uh, ages 16 to 64, uh, on a weekly basis, you know, 92% are watching some form of video on every week. Music videos, at least 50%. Uh, other kinds of videos, you know, and you can uh, you can look at these things in detail. But all of this is giving us an idea that even if you know. Uh, these are opportunities for us. This is where the you know where the world is spending their time online, uh, and so even educational content. A good number, twenty five percent, are you know are, are looking at educational content. It's it's great. Um, if you look at social media use, 
uh, again, you can see here, uh, uh, and, uh, this, this data, of course, doesn't always represent unique individuals. It's just general uh, data. Uh, like we already mentioned, you know, what 4.8 billion people have their social, social media identities, and it's are engaging in some form of social media use. And you can look at the time spent uh, on, on a daily time spent, but at least two and a half hours uh, people are spending on some form of social media use. You can see the distribution between male and female close to uh, each other. So uh, again, social media becomes uh, a huge opportunity for us. And uh, why, are, why are people typically using social media? Or 50% generally are using it to stay in touch with people. But you can look at this, almost 40% are people, people spending time on social media because they don't know what else to do with their time. Just think about it. You know, when people are free, what is it? Where do they turn to? You know, you know, we should think of people who play games or go watch or do something else. Today, when people are free, they don't have anything to do. What do they do? They turn to social media. And that's close to, you know, 40%. So it's almost like when you have free time, where are you going to be? You're going to be online on social media. So it's, that's uh, a huge uh, opportunity for us. That means uh, it's like big, people are exposing their free time, making it available online and saying, hey, do something to me while I don't have anything to do, uh, kind of uh, approach. And of course, there are all other reasons why people use social media. So uh, for us to, you know, very quickly, why should we even think of technology? Why is this so important to us? Uh, because it gives us an opportunity to reach people without interfering with them uh, in a non-intrusive way, right? So it's, I'm not, we're not forcing ourselves into their world. We're not, we're not knocking on their doors, making them open their home and saying, I'm coming and sitting in, you know, in a non-intrusive way, we're able to uh, reach people. That's uh, uh, so another reason why we use technology is it can improve uh, what we do in our services. Uh, it can improve the efficiency in how we serve people today, uh, especially in urban. We said, you know, almost over 50% of the people today, almost 60% are living in urban centers, in cities. So people expect this level of efficiency from the church. Uh, and then, of course, there are other internal reasons. You know, we can store records, we can look at data. A lot of other benefits of using technology. So what I want to do today is I just want to share a little bit about what we're doing at APC. You know, uh, of course, it's not everything. There's a lot, lot more happening. What we are doing at APC and definitely what other ministries and churches are using, how they're using technology. I just want to you know, take five minutes very quickly, give you um, uh, just a little flavor of how of what we are doing, uh, what opportunities are there, and then you know, open up time for questions. I, of course, won't be covering everything. Um, so there is where we use technology, of course, is in our Sunday services when we talk about the sound, the presentation, audio, video, for live streaming, we use the internet, social media uh, for internal operations, for communications with people uh, and, and lots of other uh, areas. The kinds of uh, platforms we're using, so our, our website. So we basically have uh, six main websites. Uh, some of them are not completed yet. We're still working on it. Uh, but um, the, uh, uh, we, all, we use an open source platform called Joomla, and uh, that, that's all our websites are built using this technology. Uh, and, and I just want to give you an idea of how, you know, the, our apcw.org website, uh, just this one year, and we can, you know, we can see this data year on year, but just this one year, that is from Jan 1 to September, uh, we've had people from 212 countries come, about more than 500 cities, they come to our church website. About uh, 187 or uh, close to 188,000 visits. This, this may not be unique visitors. Um, we've seen uh, 75,200 plus downloads of our content. You know, so that means people from more than 200 countries are coming to our church website. Uh, they're downloading things that we're making available to them and they're using it. You know, and so it's like, Hey, if we, you know, imagine if we had to travel to 212 countries or if we had to physically distribute our resources in 212 countries, it would be so expensive, it would be so difficult to do uh, in a single year. But just in the last you know, nine months or so, this has happened, uh, that people have come and taken our resources and they're using it uh, all over the world. 
So it's such an opportunity, and this is just one of our, our websites. Uh, for the e-learning platform, some of you are using the e-learning platform. We use, again, another open source product called Open edX, uh, and uh, it's helping us you know, serve students in almost 100 countries, uh, and more than 2,000 students are on, on it. Uh, and you know, Some have, of course, finished their studies, but some are studying with us. But it's a great opportunity for us to be able to use um, a, plan a platform like this to serve students uh, from over 100 countries. Um, for our internal systems, we uh, use a lot of, again, all of these are open source. That means we don't have to pay to buy these products. Uh, they're open source products. Uh, we, for managing our human resources, time reporting, we use uh, you know, a, a protocol called Orange Charity. Uh, from our mail servers, uh, for looking at you know, what's happening on our websites, we use this to manage individual data, we use a church management system. Uh, we manage data of our members in a congregation of, of uh, people across India, uh, Bible college students, all of that. We, we have three instances of um, rock, uh, rock RMS, uh, which we use um, uh, internally to run projects. Uh, we will be using this. Um, and then to manage our content, we use something called Bookstack. Uh, to manage inventory, we use another product called Snipe. So uh, just to give you an idea that we are actually using a lot of different software to help us do a lot of things internally, and then help us uh, do our ministry work. Um, externally, to communicate with people, we have a church app, uh, which uh, I, you know that, that that's available. Uh, we, we are working on a new version of this, uh, so the old version will go away, the new version will come out, and we, you know, and and people are getting used to working on apps, so we are trying to move all our interactions to using church apps. Uh, WhatsApp communications is a big thing. Uh, we use a service provider for us to communicate. Another interesting thing is. Uh, you know, we don't need to buy hardware. Uh, you, know, can you, you know, imagine if you came to our office and our office space was filled with big, big, you know, machines to host all these things. We don't do that. You know, all our, all our um, uh, software systems that we're running are all hosted on what we call as cloud service provider. So basically, we just buy the use of uh, computing power. From different service providers, and there are you know, different reasons why we use different providers. Uh, I won't get into those details, but um, we run different websites, uh, different products on different cloud service providers, uh, so that you know, they serve different purposes. But basically, the point is, we don't we don't have to go buy the hardware or buy the software, the operating systems, the computing power. We don't have to physically set up ourselves. We can just go to these cloud service providers, buy what we need, and only pay for what we use. Uh, which makes it so easy uh, these days to get set up. We can always change anytime we want. Uh, you know, so the, and and right now, for example, we're using Google Cloud. Uh, this classroom is running on Google Cloud. We have a subscription here, and that's how we do our classes. Lastly, uh, or maybe last two slides. Um, social media. All of you are familiar with. We put our put out our content on this on social media. Make it available. Uh, to people, that's uh, that's really common information. And last uh, last um, slide, I just want to mention, you know, so there's so tremendous opportunities available uh, as we look ahead. One is, uh, uh, you know, we can, you know, maybe five years ago, or, or we five or maybe even ten years ago, but we didn't have, you know, when we wanted to build so, build something, you know, we've had, it was so much of work. You know, if you wanted to build something for web and for Android and for iOS. Uh, you had to have three separate code bases, uh, you know, for each platform. But today, technology is simple where you can write code once, and you can deploy it. It can run on the web. It can run on any any device. And we are moving our church app to that. So we're building an app that will run on any device, uh, just with one code base. It's a great opportunity. It makes our life so much easier for our IT team as well. Uh, we can, you know, and and, and that, that there are tremendous opportunities available to us with uh, the advancements in uh, a, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and just some some examples would be live language translation. Some of you may have already used it. You know, you can you know you can say something in English and you can get it out in Kannada or Hindi or whatever. You know, so you can we can actually use that for our advantage to reach more people. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, we can do, you know, recommendations uh, to individuals or between individuals. We can recommend content. Then uh, we can generate new things based on old content. So, example, if we want to create uh, a promo banner for a certain event, say like 
a marriage family conference, uh, we can actually use AI to generate this content for us. You know, it can look at our old data and it can come up with something new, staying aligned to what the data we trained on. So we can use we can use this assistance. That means uh, people people can ask questions and imagine you know we are responding, giving them answers based on our content. So we ask you know what is healing, or how do I receive divine healing, or how do I overcome depression? You know the the digital assistant can actually give them very intelligent answers, but based on the content, you know, using our servants, our videos, our books, it can actually respond to that. Now it's not the best, but it's it's an alternative, right? The best would be to be able to speak to a person, but in case a person is not there, at least there's some response that people get. And last thought, I said, you know, where we can use AI is when when people are doing searches, we can give very intelligent answers rather than giving you know like just links and go look up all these links. We can take the information there and give it give them a very uh, you know like a almost like a human person speaking to them based on the searches. So these are they're just a few examples of you know, opportunities that are there, how we can use technology uh, and, and, and actually serve people in the ministry. All right, so that's it. I'll just pause here and um, I will uh, in this open up time for questions. Uh, and you're welcome to ask questions on the use of technology, uh, church and technology, uh, or you can ask about anything else, right? So don't don't limit yourself to this particular topic. Uh, anything else in church, in, in life, in ministry, you're welcome to ask us. Uh, and all our faculty, and our faculty are here to uh, help you. Thank you. Okay, uh, if nobody's going to ask questions, I'm going to call out some names and <laughs> get people to ask some questions. Go ahead. And anybody have any questions on the topic or uh, you want to ask anything else, you're welcome to do that, please. Uh, you can unmute your mic and ask questions, or you can type it in the chat as well. Uh, good morning, Pastor. Thank you so much for sharing uh, about church and technology. Uh, my question is, uh, if there's a pastor who is not well-versed with technology at all, now how can he um, utilize the power of technology and uh, get his ministry growing so any thoughts mm -hmm. on that pastor thank you yeah thanks thanks for that question nancy um yeah so some of these areas that we've mentioned uh, are very very simple very easy to use for example you know setting up social media accounts uh setting up a youtube channel or using whatsapp so i think um some of these things um are uh, easy to learn, uh, easy to use. And uh, uh, I think if, example, if a pastor is not familiar with even social media or using these things that you mentioned, uh, I think one good way to go about it is to encourage young people in his church or his congregation to take this on and do it for the church. You know, So I think it becomes a great opportunity to engage young people in the ministry and give them you know, like the just empower them and say, hey, you do it. Um, and I think um, uh, uh, so it would help uh, the ministry, it will help engage young people in the church. Uh, all the pastors to do is say, hey, you do it, and I'm backing you up. So, you know, young people can set up uh, the social media accounts, they can help with live streaming. Uh, so, get some, you know, and, and usually I would say the young people are very good in these things. So, uh, they can participate, and all the pastors will have is a is a vision for it, and just give them the room and space to say go for it. And I think uh, that's a great way that you know they can uh, do it. Of course, then other things is to reach out to others, uh, other churches, or others who have the expertise to help. Um, okay, um, Rose. So I think that's Ren. Uh, Ren's question is. Um, 
at ABC Church. If there is a new technology element in Hadley Church, will you recommend it or not? Or will you just stick with what you already are uh, using? So usually, um, we try to keep moving, uh, keep up with technology. So we, uh, we, we have to make the move. So right now, example. Um, we are moving, so our church app, things, I'm just giving the church app as an example. Our church app was deployed in 2017, so that is uh, six years ago. Uh, now we are building, we are reworking that with current technology. And uh, in fact, we are forced to do it because our current, you know, whatever platform that we deployed in is actually expiring on January 1st, 2024. So in one way, we're actually being forced to, and we, we only thought of doing it, but we're, we're actually being forced to rebuild it with new technology. So um, my answer to your question would be yes, we need to keep up with technology. We also have to, we have to always be looking forward, which means we have to let go of the old, move into the new, and you know the opportunities and the challenges are there, and we have to keep moving. Yeah. Um, hope that, I hope that answered your question. Gertrude Bertino. Is there any training required for artificial intelligence? Um, got it, yeah. So uh, it really depends. Like, it, for example, all of us are actually already using uh, um, tools and technologies that, that are based on AI. For example, uh, when you're writing a document you know, in Word or if you're using Google Docs, you get auto correction suggestions. You know, all of that is actually AI telling you that hey, you need to check your spelling, you need to check your grammar. So to use the tools that are actually made available to us through AI, that that's pretty intuitive. Or when we're using Google Maps, or uh, you know, when you're doing online shopping and things are being recommended to you, all of that is behind. All of that is artificial intelligence, you know, making recommendations and so on. So all of us are actually using it. But if you want to build something using AI, uh, that requires a lot of training. For example, right now, one of the things we're working on is to um, build a people recommendation engine. That's for our life coaching thing. Uh, that means a person A is a mentor. He has certain skills. There's a person B who's looking for a mentee. Artificial intelligence can intelligently match these people and give them a ranking. So this person is 99% close to what you need. This person is 95% close to need, and you can you know make this decision of who. So uh, I'm actually working on getting that built. But to do that, you need to understand how this, how that the, the math and the technology. So it's both mathematics and technology how that works behind it. So if you want to build something, yeah, you need to understand it. If you got to use it. Uh, it's pretty intuitive. We can use it. Um, um, any other questions? So, Kennedy, you had your hand raised. Do you want to ask the question, Kennedy? Hello, brother. Good morning. Uh, mine was, I think you've answered my question. My question was on, the, on artificial intelligence and things like chat GTP how you could use them, but now I understand. Because uh, I've seen cases where people try to link their summons through that, which I think is like, it's by passing the Holy Spirit. Why should I use uh, uh, GPT or artificial intelligence to make a summon? But I think now I understand it better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. So, yeah, there, there's nothing wrong with using the tools. But of course, you know, like when you're writing a sermon, uh, we have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Uh, but uh, we definitely, you know, there's nothing wrong with using tools to help you search for something, to find something. Then we listen to the Holy Spirit to do that. Yeah. Um, okay, Ren's got another question. Does the media team of APC try and develop an app or software and technology for the benefit of the church? Uh, I, I think uh, you're saying when you say church, you mean the congregation, you meaning the worldwide church globally. Uh, you mean uh, the world by church, everybody? Okay. So um, as of now, we, you know, so what, what, we have not developed something that other people can use. We haven't done that. Uh, our IT team. So the media team handles things like the video, audio, 
IT team handles all the software. Um, so our IT team hasn't done that. Um, but what we are willing to do is, uh, to some extent, um, share our knowledge. The reason I say to some extent is because uh, you know the, uh, our people are busy doing all the work that we already have. Uh, you know, every week there's so much of work to be done in the in media and technology. So our, our our teams are busy doing their work itself. But if somebody reaches out and asks questions or some guidance, uh, we are more than happy to share knowledge and share experience and share learning. But in a limited sense, that means we can't we don't have the time to go and build it for them. Yeah, because we already have our own work going on. But whatever knowledge we have, whatever experience we're happy to share it freely. Uh, there's no problem with that. But to answer your question, uh, Ren, we have not built something that we can give it out to others. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Yeah. Any other questions or anything? You don't have to. Okay, so that's an interesting question here from Sanjay. Um, you know, how do we help ministry youngsters who are so addicted to technology like online games, social media, and they don't spend enough time in the real world? You know, um, yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. If you go to our church website, we actually did a workshop last year on um, social media, and uh, you know, let me just give you share that link. Uh, so we have those workshop notes available on our church website. Let me just uh, uh, share that with you. Uh, but this is a good question because, you know, uh, our parents, um, uh, parents and young people are uh, are struggling with. It. So um, here's the here's the link. If you go to our church website workshops, uh, you'll find some workshops that we did last year. Uh, and oops, sorry, the PDFs. Sorry. Uh, the PDFs with the content that we um, that we used on how to address this, you know, social media addiction, and so on, and so forth. And a lot of good online resources um, that we can use. So uh, if you have time, you could go to our church website, download these PDFs, and make use of it. But let me just give you a few thoughts here. So uh, the fact is, this is a problem, right? That um, uh, not only kids but even adults are addicted. Like you saw that. The second most important reason why people use social media is they just want to occupy their time, right? So even adults are like that. You know, you don't have anything to do but check your phone, go on your Instagram, go on Facebook. Even us adults are like that. So in some way, even adults are kind of addicted to this because it's almost like our first response. When you have free time, you have nothing to do, oh, on the phone. You know, so everybody from you know teenagers to uh, adults are kind of like that. Uh, and uh, and then before we realize it, it becomes of a natural response. It becomes even an addiction. So uh, it is more so. Definitely, it's more so among the the, the younger generation they, because they are by yeah they, they we call them as digital natives. That means they grew up with that. For adults, it's an acquired thing. It's an adapted thing. Then over time, so I think one is we need to be very intentional to separate ourselves from our digital world, right? Uh, if you look in the old times, how people used to separate themselves from the, the world to go away into a time and space where uh, they could you know, meditate, or they could you know, uh, reflect and so on. Today, we, we have to do something similar, but our separation is from the digital world, which is actually more pervasive. It means the digital world is with us all the time. Like it's on our phone. The phone is in our pocket. <laughs> it's so close to us all the time. So we have to intentionally separate ourselves from our digital world, whether young or old. Uh, we have to do that. That means we intentionally leave the phone. So we, in a, in, you'll find in that PDF we've shared some very practical things. That when you come to the dinner table, don't bring your phone to the dinner table. When you're sitting as a family, no, you don't use phones. You know, so these are simple things that we can, um, that families can adapt, households can adapt, where both adults and teens or youth and so are intentionally separating themselves from 
uh, the, the digital world, you know, or uh, have those times when there is no use of media. Uh, and then, uh, or, so that's one, one thought. And there, there are a lot of like, good ideas in the PDF. I'm just mentioning one. I'll just mention one more. The other thing is the time that you do spend, use it in a very meaningful way because uh, not everything online is bad. There are lots of good, good things uh, online. I mean, there's a lot of education. So a lot of learning that, that most of us do today is through digital media. Right? Previously, we used to read physical books. Uh, some people still do that. But for many of us, you know, while you're driving, you're listening to podcasts, uh, you're listening to you know, uh, ed educational information that's building you up. So the second suggestion is the time that you do use, instead of using it on just watching some entertainment, entertainment is good for some little bit of time, but spend it in a very constructive way. So we're not saying don't use digital media, but use it in a very constructive way. Even for young people or teenagers, if we guide them and say, hey, look, these are some good things you can do uh, while you're online, you can learn things. Uh, it's just channeling them in a very positive way to, you know, to get the benefit of uh, the digital world. These are just two thoughts. There's a lot more in those PDFs that you could use, right? Okay. Um, Esther. Uh, Esther, kindly suggest uh, measures to restrict limits of social media usage. Okay. Yeah, Esther. Um, uh, once again, I'll, I'll refer you to the same PDFs in our workshops. There's a, there are lots of ideas there, you know. Um, on how families, households can um, can restrict uh, the use of media. Uh, so, like I said, you know, you could intentionally, as a family, say, when we are having meals, no phones on the table. When we are sitting together in family time, no phones. Um, nowadays, you know, on on mobile phones, you can actually turn off. You can set your own timing, like uh, on on your phones when it blacks out the the, the screen. So it's like a nighttime mode. So you can put nighttime mode. So then it kind of just tells you, hey, you're not supposed to be using the phone right now. So between example, 11 p.m. to 5 a.m., you put a nighttime mode setting on your phone, it blacks out everything. So those, those simple things. Uh, and like I said earlier, the time you do spend online, use it very profitably. Do some learning, uh, listening to good podcasts, um, you know, things like that. Okay, but a lot more ideas in the PDFs, workshop PDFs. Okay, Sri Radha. If someone wants to detox from social media and, and the other side is he wants to do online ministry, how can we balance both of these things? Yeah, so see, uh, like I said, technology is not bad in itself, right? So uh, the media and technology in itself is. You know, it's, it's a tool that we can use. Uh, so it's how we use it, what we do with it, uh, is, is what we must uh, decide on. So, um, um, so it's basically us taking charge of our time and making sure we use our time very profitably. Right? So, for example, myself, uh, I, I intentionally don't have any personal social media accounts that I use. So I don't have a Facebook account. I have an Instagram account, but I only follow three people or four people, my own family members and, uh, you know, the church thing, just to see what our media team is doing. Um, uh, and so I just, it's intentional. I just stay out of this uh, because I don't have time and I choose not to put time into it. Some people may want to do it. It's, a, it's their choice. So I don't have these social media accounts. I almost spend zero time on social media. Maybe half an hour, I quickly look, okay, what's happening on, you know, all people search YouTube channel, what's happening on our, you know, Facebook, or sometimes I don't go there, but uh, what's happening, just to see what our teams are doing and overseeing their work. That's, that's all I do. So I think these are choices we can make, but I do spend a lot of time uh, using technology uh, when we want to do things for ministry's sake. So uh, the point is, 
we are in charge. We can decide how much time we want to spend on social media. So I would say if it's if somebody's you know finding it difficult, then just cut it off. But do meaningful things on uh, using technology and media. Use meaningful things so that you can ministry work can go on. Right? So it's a choice we make. I hope it helps, um, and that's very brief. Okay. Um, Metro, Metro stars. Talk about how to mitigate the cost of managing media tech in a church setup. That's a very good question. So, so you know, this is a struggle um, that, uh, so thank you for asking that question or, or pointing that out. This is a struggle many of us urban churches have. You know, how much money and how much resources should we actually invest in technology while we are still aware that uh, especially, let's say, in, in, in our context, the Indian context, there is still a good percentage of people who don't use it. Like, so we saw in the statistics that even though, you know, about two thirds of the world population is connected, there is a one third of the world population that is not connected. And that one third is lying in Southeast Asia. That's where people are not connected in some parts of Africa. So for us, the thing that we have to keep thinking about is, hey, how much resources should we put into media and technology for our own benefit to, you know, uh, to serve our own people? While there's so many people out there who are not going to benefit from our investment in technology, they have to be reached through traditional means like printed books and people going there doing missions and so on you know so that is a big struggle and actually the sad part is the reality is the church i'm talking about the global church if you look at it the global church is putting huge amounts of money in media and technology if you look at that you know if you look at how much money is going into media and technology whereas very little amount is going into the two -third, I mean, one third of the people who still need to be reached uh, who are still not connected you know, so that's a real conscience checking check, you know, that question. So thanks, Kennedy, for asking it. So there's always that struggle, and uh, we have to, especially, example, we living in Southeast Asia or living in a part of the world where this is a reality. The Western world may not even think about it because, uh, you know, all the people are already connected or most of them are already connected. Whereas for us, we know that a huge number of people are not connected. So um, that struggle is always there. So when, when our media team you know, comes and says, we want, to, we want to buy a camera, we want to buy this, we want to do that. Uh, and uh, you know, this, is, this is a very conscience, you know, a, a, a conscience checking decision. Yes, go ahead, we can reach more people, but at the same time, hey, there are a lot of people who will not be affected by this investment. They can only be reached through the traditional means. And so we have to be careful. And that's something, you know, uh, every church has to decide. But the fact is, uh, uh, too much is being done. In a, and not enough is being done on to reach the one third. Uh, I'll just say, I'll stop with that, uh, you know. Okay, one, uh, maybe one or two more questions. Jeffina, uh, from your point of view, what are the three important things that needs to be taken care of by someone who has an online ministry um, so I think um, you know someone doing ministry online uh, a good, good question interesting question uh, somebody doing ministry online I think the focus and the priority has always it should always be can I, first thing is is it is there a way that I can minister to people in person right um, online is good but remember online is only secondary to person to person ministry Right. Uh, there are conveniences to doing ministry online. There are advantages to doing ministry online, but it can never replace person-to-person -person ministry. There's so much that happens when you meet somebody person-to-person, -person, you sit across and talk on the table uh, that you cannot do through uh, the online approach. So uh, we have to be very conscious of it and say, you know, hey, I, I cannot let online ministry replace what I need to do person to person, you know, by, by touching people really. Uh, so that's one thing I would say we should be mindful about while we're doing online ministry, be mindful of it. 
um, uh, what are the three important things you need to be taken care of? So, uh, sorry, I, I don't want to answer, you know, give you talk about things that you may not be looking for. Are you talking about while doing online ministry, uh, Jeff, you know, or I mean, are you talking ministry in general? Or are you talking about, okay, how can I do online ministry better? What was, what is the direction of the question? I uh, hope you can hear me plus. Yes, so, go ahead. Uh, uh, I just want to know, like, uh, someone is leading an online ministry. Uh, what are the three major things that needs to be taken care of? What are the priorities uh, should be like, uh, that must um, be like a main focus as we are leading? Because I believe it's not only a boast, posting contents or uh, just posting some random videos. I believe it's more about connecting with the people over there. So uh, what are from your point of view, what would be the three major things that needs to be taken care of? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I understand the question. Sorry, I was going in a different direction. Yeah, so first, the most important thing is, I would say, keep it real, right? The problem with the online ministry is, um, and what we call what we call this, what we generally call as an online persona. That means the online persona that is created is very different from who the person is in reality. And this is what you know is is actually happening. So you know we have all these big influencers, we even Christian ministries. They look very nice online, but they are very different in reality. So what's seen online, the online persona of an individual or an organization or a ministry is actually very different from ground reality. And uh, sometimes this happens intentionally because you know, they're just trying to create this persona. Sometimes it happens unintentionally. So my first thing would be, hey, keep it real, as real as possible. Because the tendency with online ministry is you can do anything. You can pretend to be anything you want online, and nobody will know. You know, nobody will know what reality is. So, first thing, keep it real. You know, it's almost like what you see online is what people should experience in person. Don't create a false persona. Don't create a false real, false reality or false expression of what reality is. So that's the first thing I would say. And we have to be very watchful about when we're, when we're engaging in online ministry. Otherwise, the online looks, everything looks great, you know, uh, sort of thing. Um, the second thing is um, while we're doing online ministry, um, you know, we have the benefit of reaching lots of people, but see how and where, you know, the personal touch can be brought about, you know, uh, that that one on one connect. Uh, through online. So I, I would put that as uh, um, uh, a very important part of uh, the um, uh, part of doing online ministry is, is to establish personal connectors. So while the thing is there, you know, people can enjoy a sermon, but what does it mean? You know, who, who will they connect to to talk about it or ask questions or uh, take that and apply it to their own personal lives, their personal connect. So this is a, a big challenge, even which we are struggling with in our Bible college. It's like, okay, we have students doing online courses, which is nice, but how can we serve them personally? How can we get involved in their lives? Every, every student is having something different going on in their lives. They're having some questions. How can we answer it? How can we minister to them very personal? So that, that is an important part. Uh, while Online ministry is giving us a great opportunity. It also has this drawback. And how do we bridge that? How do we make a person connect? So that would be some third thing that I would um, think about meeting online ministry. And uh, thirdly, I would say, you know, direct people back, uh, uh, people back to local churches. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes I hear people say, uh, I am part of a church somewhere there. You know, some other country. I am part of that church. I said, and, and I think about how, how ridiculous that is because that church may not even know you're part of that congregation. You know, so it's okay to connect and you know participate in an online service, but that doesn't mean you are part of that local church community. You know, that church you're watching an online service in another part of the world. 
but you need to belong to a local church community in where you are physically connecting with people, serving people. So I would say whatever online business we do, we need to guide people back to their local churches. Okay. These would be, at least in my mind, uh, at this moment, three of these topics. Okay, um, we are out of time. Uh, let me just try to see if I can uh, take these last two questions. Uh, uh, Anand, about the organization, which are there to connect people around the world with the local churches or groups? Um, um, which connect people to local churches or groups? Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not too, too sure. I think you know we'll have to just Google. I think I would say Google church, Google the church near me or churches near me, and uh, you know they will help you find churches in in those areas. But I don't know if one one organization can do it universally in every part of the world. I'm not aware of that. Okay, shall we wrap up for today? Uh, because we need to get ready for our classes, and I don't want to hold that up. Uh, thank you so much for this engaging time. I appreciate all the questions. Uh, we can always pick this up some other time. Uh, could um, somebody close in prayer, please, and dismiss us? Thank you. Jeffina, you want to close in prayer? Oh, somebody. Then, oh, it's a connection. Yes, Pastor. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for this time of mentoring hour that we had. We thank you for uh, the social platforms, the technology that has developed. God, we just pray that whatever you have given us, the talents that you have filled us with, God, we pray that we will use it in the right way to glorify your kingdom. And whatever we have learned uh, through this mentoring hour, we will apply it in your life and we will live for your glory. We bless everyone who has joined here in the name of Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Enjoy your class today. Have a good day. Bye.